I'm the tech guy, and I didn't turn it on. Uh, first, I want to say hi, for those of you who remember the surviving the information glut lecture. Are you all surviving the information glut? So-so, maybe? And you all have study groups? I just want to start off by saying, what is the probability that back-to-back -back lectures given in this course would be by two card-carrying, board-certified kidney doctors. Dr. Van Adelsberg and I are both uh, former members of the nephrology department. I just found that fascinating. We've known each other for many years. I'm going to talk, I, you know, I don't overstate things, uh, but I'd like to think this is the most important lecture you're going to hear the whole year. Because it's the one that you will be able to take into the clerkships with the punchlines I'm going to give you today. And just if I can, you know, end the lecture and, you know, at the beginning, the take home today is to be skeptical about new drugs and, if possible, never prescribe a new drug unless it's life saving and there's no other option. So we're going to talk about adverse events. And I thought I. How's this? Is that better? Okay. You're welcome. I'll see if I can figure out how to use the volume. Uh, nah, let's leave it at that. Okay, I'll try and also, I, as I crank up during the talk, I end up talking louder and louder. <laughs> so I used to have the students in the front give me a sign that I was shouting, but I, I, I try to modulate. So let's talk about the Black Death, the plague. There's a, there are hundreds of great oil paintings uh, rendering the, the plague, and we can go back in history and find out that for that one episode of the plague during the whatever 14th century, 20 million people died. One out of five people died, and probably more, and it came back decades later. You can see it also hit London in the, in the 17th century. Had they only had ciprofloxacin. This is an antibiotic. It's been around a long time. It's got its problems. But it's been, it costs nothing. You can probably get a 30-day prescription for ten, you know, a dollar. Imagine if you were the person there in the 14th century and you had this magic potion called ciprofloxacin. You would have saved 20 million people. None of us, all aggregate in our lifetime, will ever save 20 million people. But alas, ciprofloxacin has its own adverse effects, events, effects. and this is just a partial list. But the worst is that it interacts with a bunch of drugs which cause uh, torsades de point, which is a precursor to atrial fibrillation and death. So there are a whole bunch of people that can't take Cipro because if they're taking another drug, I'm going to talk about drug-drug interactions later on, they will possibly drop dead, literally. So you can imagine if you had 20 million people and the, and the, the probability of an adverse event was one out of 20,000, some really low number, it means that 100 people that you treated would have died from the drug. So no drug doesn't come without side effects. And no matter what you hear on TV, when they rattle through all the side effects, which sound like they're making it up and none of them are true, there is no drug that does not have side effects. And the challenge is figuring out who's going to have a side effect and who isn't, and then how to figure that into your decision analysis when weighing the pros and cons. So let's talk about the scope of the problem. These are all underestimates. None of us believe these results are what they represent. But in the last publication this past year is estimated that 770,000 injuries or deaths are due to adverse events to drugs. The expenses are somewhere over $5 billion. Again, we all think that this is an underestimate. And the costs might be anywhere up to $10,000 for an extra hospitalization. I mean, there been 30 years of research on the sort of informatic side of adverse drug events, and I'm going to share some of that with you today. It's a huge problem. So we're going to talk about how to avoid them by knowing what causes them. So our learning objectives today, when you're finished studying this, not necessarily during this lecture, you should be able to discuss the mechanisms and give examples of short and long-term adverse events. You should be able to list some of the common short and long-term adverse events. I know you haven't had your organ systems yet. It'll be a little dicey. I tried to pick some that fit into what you've already had. Uh, you should be able to describe and define collateral consequences. And I'll describe what that means. It means the drug itself doesn't cause the problem. It's a result of the drug that causes the problem. Discuss some mechanisms of drug-drug interactions. We'll talk about the best resources 
of, you know, you can even search them while you're listening to this lecture. But the library has a spectacular library of uh, electronic resources for which they pay a lot of money for. We're going to lastly talk about how do you identify adverse events. There are all these drugs out there that are on the market. You know, how can we, the academic community, figure out what adverse events are resulting from those drugs, even though they've never been described? So let's talk about two different kinds, obviously. Short-term adverse events, it happens within minutes, maybe weeks. You give someone penicillin in the emergency room, they get anaphylaxis in, you know, in 60 seconds after it's absorbed and have the consequences of that. The mechanisms are largely known. I'll talk about where the mechanisms are not largely known. And then they're long-term. These are real problems. You know, you're taking a drug for 30 years and then it's shown that for that long-term consequences are Alzheimer's. So before you commit a person to a long-term drug, it, 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 it's nice to know what the long-term effects are. Some of them we know pretty well. They've been around for 30 years. Others we don't know at all. And so here are short-term adverse event reactions. The, the literature divides them up in A and B. A is the result, the uh, mechanism of action is known, and the adverse event is an exaggeration of that a mechanism. I mean, you've had, I think you've had beta blockers or beta agonists. So if you take too much of beta blocker, you're going to have a low heart rate, a bradycardia. And that's not unexpected. We know what the drug, how the drug works, and the heart responded appropriately. But then there are type B that are really unpredictable. They're unpredictable because we don't actually know what the mechanism is. You know, what if you gave someone a beta blocker and they got a skin rash. I mean, there's no way to, that probably is not due to the beta um, blocking effect. It's due to something else. And you also don't know which patients are going to be affected by it. If you give everybody in this room like a triple dose of beta blocker, all of our heart rates are going to go down. But for the type B, you give someone a drug, you don't know in advance if that patient is going to have that adverse events, uh, event. And now, obviously, with uh, genomics really leading the role here in precision medicine, We'll have a better idea. I'm sure you've already heard about that. But then I made up a type C. I, you know, full disclosure here, I made up this type C. I have no idea if anybody has, you know, in the literature, I did look up type C and it didn't, I couldn't find it. But it's what I would call the consequences of taking a drug. A simple example, and I'll, I'll drill down later on in the talk. Uh, you know, an elderly patient has an allergy. So they take a typical cold medicine or an allergy pill. Makes them drowsy, they're driving, and they drive off the road and get into a car accident. That drug did not cause the car accident, but the drug caused a reaction in the person which caused the car accident. I'll give you some more examples later on. All right, so type A, predictable. Uh, why would you have too much of a drug? There are a couple obvious possibilities. Accidental overdose, I'll show you. You order medicine on the wrong patient. I know you're, you can't believe that's the case, but I'm going to show you the numbers in a second. Or you give the wrong dose. Happens all the time. Increased blood, blood levels. I know you've heard about pharmacokinetics. Uh, if you don't metabolize the drug well, you're going to have increased levels. Uh, you may have increased levels because the two organs which play a major role in getting rid of the drug, the liver through meta metabolism and the kidney through clearance, they have liver or kidney failure uh, or disease and, and the blood levels of the drug are higher. Or you just have a genetic predisposition to a slow metabolism. And lastly, some patients are just really sensitive to a drug uh, at the usual dose. Uh, there's not a lot known about it. So let's talk about overdose. This is a study that was done here by Rob Green, who's down at the bottom as an author. He's an ER doc, and he's also a biomedical informaticist. And they wanted to know, how often do we order the wrong drug or test on a person in this hospital? I, again, it's shocking. I mean, when you tell people who are not in medicine about this statistic, you know, their jaws drop. It ends up that every day at NYP Columbia, six patients get orders written on them that shouldn't have been written on them. Now, that has gotten better because Rob developed something in electronic health record where it flashes the patient's picture, tells what the diseases are, and the prescriber goes, well, hold on a second. <laughs> That's not the person I wanted to write this order on. That's gotten better. They published it, uh, and it was very effective. But you can see, so you order a beta blocker on Mrs. Smith uh, instead of Mrs. Jones. Mrs. Smith, who is, you know, has bradycardia of, and, and was there for something else, like a hip replacement. That's one reason. The second cause is accidental overdose. This happens all the time. It is better now with the electronic health record, but it is still a problem. 
So this is a writer, uh, Betsy Lehman, who wrote for the Globe, Boston Globe. She was a famous award-winning writer. She had breast cancer. She got chemotherapy ordered, and they ordered 10 times the dose they were supposed to. Maybe a decimal point was missing. Maybe a zero was missing. Who knows? And she eventually died. So overdose is a problem. Uh, it, it, it's not uncommon. Uh, fortunately, again, it's, uh, you know, the incidence is decreasing. Here's another accidental overdose. This is a little bit uh, subtle, but um, it, there's a, d a drug for seizures. It's called Dilantin, Fentuin. And so my mother is, she's 97, she's in great health. About 10 years ago, she's in her 80s, she wants to put feed, seeds in the bird feeder in her backyard. So she takes out the stepladder, she goes over, it's a hill. I mean, it's literally like this. She steps on it and then she falls over and she clonks her head. She gets admitted to Southampton Hospital, I drive out there. and. What you do is you get a CAT scan to see if she had a bleed, and then you put them on anti-seizure medicines. That's a precaution. So I'm sitting there, she's lying on the gurney, she's getting her head scanned, and the scan's over, and she's got an IV, and the nurse comes by and is holding Dilantin, and I said, you know, what are you giving? She said, one gram, one gram of Dilantin. And I thought, wow, that takes me back to my days of being an intern, like in the 70s. That one gram was like the gold standard. You always give someone one gram. But only then did it occur to me that she's this tiny person. Is it one size fits all? You give a gram to, you know, the elephant is worried about having a seizure. You give them one gram? So I, I thought it would be fun to see who was the biggest person I could think of. Uh, Shaq O'Neal is seven foot one. He weighs almost 400 pounds. Does he get one gram too? So we're better at it now, but and in pediatrics, dosing is de rigueur. I mean, they have calculators if a, patient, if a kid is three years old or seven, weighs this or weighs that. But in adult medicine, it's off one size fits all. My mother, as I said, 97, she gets the same dose. So we have to say to the doctor, we have to say to her, just bite off a little piece of that pill. That would be enough for you. Now, here are some short-term adverse drug reactions. As I mentioned, it's the, um, we already talked about bradycardia and beta blocking. What about type B? These are more complicated because the reaction is not a result of the action, of the known action of the drug. I mentioned anaphylaxis. Now, down the road, we're going to be able to predict that, if not already. I mean, there are tests for penicillin allergy. Uh, the last time I looked at it, it was sort of iffy. But at some point, we'll know you know, your whole genome has been sequenced that you better not take penicillin because you'll have anaphylaxis. Um, so common adverse drug reactions where it's somewhat unpredictable, acute kidney injury. Uh, antibiotics, why giving an antibiotic to one person causes their kidney to fail, another person has no effect. Uh, you've had non-steroidals, I think. Um, those are anti-inflammatory. We actually do know why it hurts the kidney because it involves uh, blood flow. Liver injury, many drugs cause liver injury in some patients and not others, like the statins, which are for cholesterol, which I'm going to talk about a lot today. The statins cause liver injury in one group of patients and doesn't do anything in the other patients. We don't know what the mechanism is. Rhabdomyolysis, that's where the muscles dissolve. It releases myoglobin and that causes kidney damage. It causes death, basically, if it's, if it's significant enough. Some statins do and some don't. I'm going to talk more about that later. And last, the skin reactions, you name it, the skin reaction uh, that you can think of, it's been described uh, from the benign to the fatal. Many of these um, unpredictable uh, adverse events are immunologically mediated, um, and, but still you get, there's some drugs that cause complete bone marrow failure, probably immunologically mediated, and others, patients can take it with impunity. So I think um, precision medicine is down your career road is going to be uh, enlightening. Now I want to make two really important points. The first is that drugs of a class don't necessarily have all the same side effects and to the same degree. I just you know, my, my sister uh, has high cholesterol and she went to her, card she's a pediatric cardiologist, she's a brilliant person, she's whatever, however old she is. And uh, at that age, you just don't want to think about it. And the doctor prescribed a brand new statin that has never, you know, it just came out on the market. Now, why would you do that when you don't really know what the, class, what the effects are? Because one drug in a class may be uh, damaging in another one. A great example, I think, are aminoglycosides. These are life-saving antibiotics, life-saving. And they have, they're similar, but one is incredibly toxic to the ear, 
hair cells, and the kidney, neomycin. It was used as a pill or a, you know, in the bloodstream years ago. I had a patient who became deaf after taking, and actually neomycin got into her body from a wound. Uh, and kidney, she damaged, had kidney damage. And tobamycin is the least toxic. They both kill the same bug, but one is not toxic and the other one is. So when you think of a class, just because a, a group, a, a drug in a class has no serious adverse event, don't assume that the newest one you know, that's being advertised on TV doesn't have an effect. I think the statins are a great example of this. Atorvastatin is less toxic to muscle cells, I mentioned rhabdomyolysis, whereas Baycol was recalled. I'm going to show you an alarming article from the Times uh, later on in this talk. Baycol was a statin that ended up being yanked from the market because it caused fatal rhabdomyolysis. I haven't taken organic chemistry in 50 years, but I think you will admit that those drugs sort of more or less look the same. There's no way to predict, shy of you know, serious laboratory uh, investigation, which of those drugs is going to cause fatal rhabdomyolysis and being pulled off the market, and the other one being a very wonderful drug to lower patients' cholesterol. That's the, same. the second important point I'd like to think is not all patients suffer the adverse event. Some patients can take Lipitor and others can't. And uh, there are obviously genetic uh, predispositions. Like the, the, my whole family has trouble with the statins and Lipitor. And then what's interesting about this, I just sort of you know, looked this up a couple days ago. There are all sorts, it's not just one gene that predisposes a patient to a side effect. It could be in many genes. The end result is the, is the um, same, which is ra you know, rhabdomyolysis or muscle pain. Uh, but there are all sorts of different genes that can come out with the same phenotype. All right, so let's talk about collateral consequences. Again, I made that up. Uh, dizziness. My mother got that big injection of the anti-seizure medicine. She was dizzy that night. That was before my younger sister and I came up with the strategy is when a parent is in the hospital, one of you has to be there 24 hours a day, period. Because they're going to wake up in the middle of the night, not know where they are. Even if they're young and not seen on, they're not going to know where they are. The beds are always high. They're going to trip and fall on the way to the bathroom. She almost fell in the bathroom that night, uh, and she's totally, you know, with it, because she was dizzy from the Dilantin. And so I thought, you know, if she, if she hit her head and died in the bathroom, nobody would say, well, the Dilantin was responsible for that. They'd say, well, she's old, even though that was 10 years ago, she's still with us. Uh, she fell, and she died as a result of that. So this is what I'd call a collateral consequence. What are some other examples? I've already mentioned car accidents and antihistamines. Uh, birth control pills may lead to unprotected sex and an increased incidence of STDs. Now, the birth control pills don't cause the STDs, obviously, but they allow for a change in behavior which ends up resulting in a higher incidence of STDs. And a last, and it doesn't quite fit into this, but medications for pain relief cause addiction. We have an absolute epidemic of addicted people in this country to pain meds that we prescribe. And maybe, I mean, there's a little bit of, you know, giving the drug to some, it was indirectly causing the addiction. If they didn't have the drug, they wouldn't be addicted. Uh, but whatever the biological determinants are of addiction, patients taking that drug do become addicted. And there are all these overdose deaths that you see reported in the, in the paper. Um, so again, it's not the actual drug that is causing the addiction, uh, but it may be in a person who has propensity to it. Um, let me end with the beers criteria, and I really want you to think about this when you go to the wards. Um, for the last 20 years, uh, I guess it was Dr. Beers, but I'm not sure about that. It's not beers, <laughs> you know, alcohol beers. Uh, the beers criteria, which are basically for an elderly patient, there's a list of drugs that you should never, ever prescribe for them. There are sometimes, you know, compelling circumstances, but never. Uh, like, you're in clinic, you're on your primary care rotation, you know, in a year from now. Wow, a year. Um, and your patient comes in, she's, you know, 82, and she's, say, how are you? I'm, I'm anxious. And why are you anxious? Well, you know, my grandson is applying to Columbia, and I don't know if he's going to get in. I'm all uptight about that. Give me a Valium. And your answer is, under no circumstance am I going to give you one of those drugs that is going to affect your sensorium. Older patients have 
sort of cognitive decline as a result of all sorts of medicines. Valium is an easy one. We know that it affects the brain. But there are other drugs that you would never expect uh, affect their, you know, their cognitive ability. And for, there are EHRs now, electronic health records, that have the Beers criteria built into them. And you can't prescribe those drugs if the machine looks and sees that you're over 65. All right, let's move on to long-term adverse events. These are the ones that worry me because you don't know it's a long-term adverse event until a long term has passed and maybe it's too late. So I'm going to talk about one group of drugs. I've already mentioned statins. I'm going to talk about the protein pump inhibitors, PPIs, you know, the purple pill, all those antacid medicines that are in CVS. We have a little indigestion to take the purple pill. It inhibits the proton pump in your stomach, decreases acid. It's a, it's a miracle drug. Um, but who knew that it also affects the bone? See, when it was released, nobody knew that. But their proton pump, I mean, those of us who are scientists thought, how naive can you be that, to think that there are only proton pumps in the stomach? Actually, my mentor, Kai Salakati, who you'll hear from in the next semester when he teaches the kidney, he actually showed that there was a proton pump in the kidney. So we're saying, well, how can you be so naive that you don't think that this drug doesn't act elsewhere? Maybe there's a proton pump in your brain. So the PPIs are a real problem. And it was shown after decades of men who took the PPIs like on a daily basis, they had osteoporosis and bone fractures. Osteoporosis is very uncommon in men uh, because, you know, for the obvious reasons. And PPIs predispose them to osteoporosis and bone fractures. Chronic kidney disease, if you take a couple Tylenol every day for 30 years, you will end up with kidney damage. Who, who would have suspected that? Because when you give Tylenol, you know, for a couple of weeks or even a couple of months, the kidney's fine. The kidney says, I'm okay. But building, if, you, if, it's, if it's day in and day out over years, then it, it can, in some patients will cause kidney damage. And I've already mentioned the statins. Uh, who knew that long-term use of the statins actually predisposes to diabetes in a person who otherwise wouldn't have been uh, developed diabetes? So the long-term events are completely unpredictable. And it's, again, you only notice them after a patient has taken them long term. Um, again, I already mentioned the original target was the stomach, uh, but we now that know that the pumps also work, uh, are in the kidney and the bone. These are uh, targets, and the FDA says current literature has identified associations between PPI use and the risk of osteoporotic related fractures. Vitamin B12 deficiency, you probably, maybe you learned it already, but you need acid to absorb vitamin B12. Uh, kidney disease injury, dementia, these are serious complications. Uh, and then you're asking, well, what do you do? You just have your patient change their lifestyle so they don't get indigestion every day and don't have to take the drug. Now, I just want to point out that pharma is not a criticism of pharma. This is what, I love pharma. Pharma has produced ciprofloxacin. It could, have, it could have saved 20 million lives. But pharma's only interest is whether or not the drug they've discovered works the way it hope it, hope it, it, it will. They're like bacterial infection, let's say flesh-eating bacteria, a scourge, you know, really difficult to treat. They look through a whole bunch of antibiotics and they find genomycin. Great drug, works. That's good enough for them. But they don't ask the next question, which is, well, what are the other targets of genomycin? Oh, let's look at the kidney and see if genomycin affects the kidney. Now, why would they do that? They've already shown that they're selling it to treat those lethal infections, and we're glad they have the drug, and they've made the drug, but they're not interested in looking at the other targets. And so, the other, so it's up to us to figure out what those other targets are, and at the end, I'm going to show you how we do that. Now, now I'd like to move on to two drug adverse events. You've taken two drugs, and that causes an adverse event. Uh, obviously, you've learned this in your course already, uh, one drug may affect the metabolism of the other. I read that propafenone, which is an antiarrhythmic, increases the level of beta blockers fourfold. I've never seen a ramp up. So, so you have a patient on a beta blocker, you give them the antiarrhythmic, and the next thing you know, their, their pulse is 20, because the dose they were on of the beta blocker is now four times higher. Then there are drugs that have a different primary effect. This is the scariest one. Two drugs that have different primary effects, when taken together, do a, do a third thing. That causes an adverse event by a different mechanism. Completely unpredictable. So I'm going to show you a protein pump inhibitor, proton pump inhibitor, which I just mentioned, 
and an antibiotic cause long QT syndrome, which predisposes to ventricular fibrillation and death. So I'll introduce you, uh, and lastly, one that we think about here, and I'll show you um, the HR, how the HR deals with this. We have two drugs that have the same effect. You know, aspirin and warfarin is an anticoagulant. You want to give a patient two drugs to inhibit coagulation, acting by different mechanisms. There are times that you want to do that, but often you didn't, you didn't realize it. Uh, it's not really a drug-drug interaction. So I'm going to, let's drill down on this. So drugs have different unpredictable interactions. So imagine the patient's taking drug A, normal conduction. And they're also taking drug B, which has never, ever been shown to affect conduction. But when taken together, they cause prolonged QT and the uh, sudden death, you know, a predisposition to sudden death. And um, these are two drugs that Nick Tatnetti, let's see where he is, Nick Tatnetti, who is a real star, he's a wonderful person, he's brilliant, he showed that an over-the-counter CVS Walgreens drug, Prevacid, when combined with ceftriaxone, that's a cephalosporin, it's like penicillin, it's been around for years, these drugs are so benign, I mean anybody can take a cephalosporin, almost anybody. When given together, they actually prolong the QT and predispose to sudden death. And this is terrifying because there's no way for us to say beforehand, oh, I better not give those two drugs that have never affected conduction because they might affect conduction. There's absolutely no way to know that. It has to be shown by data mining. Um, there are companies out there. Nick has a whole bunch of other uh, studies. Uh, but it's up to us, somebody else, to figure out that this combination, for reasons that we couldn't possibly explain, cause a potentially life-threatening adverse event. So why is that a problem here for all of us around the world? That polypharmacy is rampant. That means you're taking five or more drugs. Um, and the prevalence, if you, you know, if 60% if of our population is taking one drug, 15% of our population is taking more than one drug, and the elderly take an average of five plus drugs. We have patients, when you go to the wards, and maybe when you do your physical diagnosis in the spring, if you haven't already started, you'll see people in the hospital who are on 12 drugs, 15 drugs. Some of them are redundant. Some of them are even competing with each other. But, and, and some of them are deathly ill and need 15 drugs. But the point is the potential for drug-drug interaction is really almost exponential. You know, for five drugs, there are at least 10 different drug-drug pairs. So if one of those ends up being one of Nick's pairs, then the patient is, is at risk for a serious adverse event. So polypharmacy is rampant. Part of it is our fault. Part of it's the patient's fault. They see the ads on TV. They come to the office and they want that drug or that drug. Changing your lifestyle, which is often the, the, the treatment for a lot of these, a lot of patient illnesses, uh, is the hardest thing to do on the planet, and most people would rather take a drug. The, there's a sort of epidemic of polypharmacy. So let me just talk one example of a drug-drug interaction uh, that was real life. This is uh, Libby Zion. Uh, she was a, a college student in the 80s. She came to New York. Her father's a famous uh, lawyer. Uh, she, was, had anti she had depression. She was on an antidepressant, which is a monoamine oxidase inhibitor, one of the enzymes that's involved, I think, in uh, neurotransmitter metabolism. She was admitted to Cornell. and. She was, because she had abdominal pain, and she was uh, prescribed meperidine, which is Demerol. I'm sure you've all heard about, heard Demerol, people, you know, you take it for pain relief. So she had the monoamine oxidase inhibitor, and she had Demerol. Every time I give this, I've shown this slide now for like, you know, 15 years. It makes me nervous every time. Because I think, I mean, I wouldn't have known that was a drug-drug interaction. It wasn't, any, there was no way to look that up. There was no Google, didn't exist. Um, the founders of Google probably still hadn't been born yet. But that is a lethal, potentially lethal drug-drug interaction. So they gave her, she took both drugs, she got hyperthermia, 107, she had what is called now the serotonin syndrome, which we didn't know about then, and she died. And as recently as in 2012, you could be admitted to NYP and receive those two drugs. That there was no way to communicate and stop people from prescribing both drugs. So I think it's, you know, we can pat ourselves on the back that for at least six years, that is not allowed to prescribe those drugs. But you know all throughout the, hosp the country, there are hospitals that don't have our sophisticated NYP 
uh, software in the electronic health record. That you can, so it, you can imagine that patients will be rolling into the hospital elsewhere and someone may end up prescribing those two drugs. So how do we deal with this? We've got an electronic health record um, and you, we have the following algorithm. I mean, we actually have this. I'll show you the output in a second. Order Demerol. The first thing the machine does is look at all the drugs the patient's taking. Uh, Monoamine oxidase inhibitor, insulin, and morphine. I just made those up. Then it consults the interaction table. This is the way it works. Uh, and now it's become commercialized. And it sees that, oh dear, patient is, uh, cannot get Demerol because they have a monoamine oxidase inhibitor. Uh, they can if they're on, only on insulin, but and then opiates, uh, morphine, and Demerol to sort of uh, do the same thing. Why would you want to do that? But it won't, it won't harm the patient you know, if, it's, if she's monitored. But so it sees the Demerol, and it creates what we call a hard stop. You literally, no matter what you do, you can you know, bang on the, the EHR. You can't order those two drugs. You, know, you can't get on the phone, irate, I want to order those two drugs. It's called a hard stop. It infuriates practitioners. And I think I'll, I'll explain a little uh, later about uh, alert fatigue. It infuriates people, but it's a hard stop, as well as should be. You should not be allowed to order those two drugs. And this is the, I know you can't see this, but this is what you'll see on our electronic health record. It actually says, there's a little red icon you can see in the middle of the box. It says basically you can't order these. And this, and this is why. We believe in uh, you know, education. There's a little blurb that goes along with it, and hopefully, you know, the practitioner reads it and says, okay, great, I'm not going to do that again. And now I've learned something. Can't expect a human to know all this. That's why we have machines. You can't, there's just too much to learn, and then if you try to learn it, you'll think that you know it, and that will be wrong. So here are the top 20 drug-drug interactions that prompt an alert here at NYP. Uh, and the uh, uh, column along the left is how many times that alert was prompted. And so people, uh, pr providers order warfarin, which is the anticoagulant, and aspirin, which is an anticoagulant. So they get a prompt. But you'll notice, I love it, machines are smart, but they're not that smart. You can see this redundancy. If, you, if the patient's on aspirin and you order warfarin, you get a prompt. And the patient's on warfarin and, and you know, um, order aspirin, you get a prompt. Um, but that is still important, but it's not a hard stop. You can still order those drugs. And, and, and instead, you get, a, you get a warning. So I've highlighted the, um, the uh, warfarin aspirin to see how many times it shows up. And what happens is the provider says, I already know that. I'm ordering these two drugs. I've earned the right, you know, through my studies, <laughs> to order those two drugs, sort of yelling at the machine, which is always a bad sign when you see a provider yelling at the machine. And what happens is providers develop, a, it's called alert fatigue. This is an important term. I mean, you've had it, you know, you get all these emails, you just go, you nix them out. You don't even read them. You know, I try to unsubscribe, but it's usually unsuccessful. Um, and you get, you, it's, you know, it's like fire drills. And, I mean, the, the building could be burning down, and I hear the fire drill, and I go, yeah, right, fine, okay, it's a test. Unless someone's on the last speaker yelling, this is not a test. So we get alert fatigue. It's a real problem. And so we have these machines that are brilliant in terms of preventing you from doing something bad. But you are so overwhelmed by alerts that you ignore them. So some guys, uh, a team at Harvard did the following study. Brilliant guy, David Bates. Um, he looked at what is the cost to patients by ignoring an alert. So they studied the United States one year. In one year, five and a half million medication-related alerts might have been over, inappropriately overridden. I already told you, some of them are hard stop. You can't override them. Resulting in approximately 200,000 adverse events. You can imagine if you, know, you or your loved one went to the hospital and had an adverse event, and then you found out that the machine told the doctor not to do that, you'd be crazed, infuriated. But that's the problem. And it costs, again, these are, you know, these are sort of guesstimates that they did. He's, as I mentioned, he's a real star, and I tend to believe there's about $2 billion for treating those adverse events. So we have a real problem. We've got a life-saving tool, and people ignore the, you know, the prompts on a routine basis. 
So I want to, um, that, I hope that alerts you to when you go to your clerkships and your resident gets a prompt that put your arm around them, well, whatever, pat and say, look, let me give you a lesson in alert, ignoring alerts. You, do you know that? And, and why are you overriding that alert? Let me um, finish up the talk by talking about resources. Where do you learn about adverse events? Uh, and there are some great resources that the library has. Uh, this is the far right of the electronic uh, uh, sources in our library. This is the Health Science Library. The website, I understand, from uh, Anna Gesselman is being redone, so you'll have to figure out where this is. But right now, it still looks like this. On the right side are all resources for your benefit. The library pays tens of thousands of dollars, if not, to have access to this. We have one of the best electronic libraries in the world. Unbelievable. Uh, and you can access from home through a VPN. So down here, it says uh, more resources, and it takes you to this page on the right, and then you can see down here is drug information. My favorite is uh, Micromedics. Micromedics is a wonderful resource. You can get it on your phone. Uh, I mean, speaking of phones, my mother was, while I'm thinking about it, she was taking amiodarone, which is an antiarrhythmic, and she took Cipro, the drug I just told you, has a lot of interactions. And so she took Cipro, and she calls me one, uh, you know, over the weekend. She says, you know, Herbie, I, I don't feel well. I feel kind of, I feel terrible. Um, I think it's the Cipro. I'm going to stop it. I had Hippocrates on my phone, or whatever it was called then, you know, Palm Pilot. And I looked up Cipro and amiodarone, and it says, don't give together, because it causes a prolonged QT. So she was probably having some arrhythmia. I was horrified and embarrassed by the fact that I didn't look that up in advance. None of her, do every time she went to a doctor after that, whatever, they'd always want to order Cipro or something like Cipro. And, and she would tell them, well, I'm on amio amiodarone, I'm not supposed to take that. So you can get Hippocrates on your phone and you can get Micromedics on your phone. Um, here is the Micromedics blurb on the drugs that Libby Zion was taking. You see that red uh, stop sign, or whatever you call that, icon in the middle, you absolutely contraindicate it. Now there's another resource which you're going to, maybe you already know about, when you do your write-ups for your um, uh, preceptors or you do your physical diagnosis course, you probably will gravitate towards a resource called UpToDate if you don't know about it already. It is fantastic. It is mainly designed for therapy. Uh, for residents and you know, attendings, it, it's less about diagnosis. So it's got its, I'll give you a lecture in the second year on resources. But it does have a great uh, drug interaction. Uh, so if you're in up to date, you might as well hit the drug interaction button. And you can see what up to date says about those two drugs. It is a X in a red box. Do not give. So you're protected. If there's any doubt in your mind when you're going to prescribe something or your resident's prescribing something, just look it up first. The, the, the HR, because of, of uh, alert fatigue, they actually had to cut back on the number of interactions they had prompting the house staff uh, and the physicians because there were just so many. So I love, you know, generally I look things up on one of these two resources. What about information from pharma. Now this is, you're going to hear a lot about this from me and other people over the years. Um, this was a study done, admittedly it was a, a while back, and it, and it basically asked medical students, well what are the resources you use to learn about drugs? Obviously basic medical journals, medical databases, which are now much more plentiful, um, EBM guidelines, we have, we have all sorts of guidelines that you can access on the web, uh, which will help you decide which drug. But, but actually half of them said they used, they thought that the information from pharma was useful. And uh, I'll make the case now that it's unacceptable to use pharma information, and I'll explain why. First, information from a drug company is an ad, it is not data. That's as simple as that, that that's basically, they would never put out a result that showed that their drug caused rhabdomyolysis and didn't work. All those drugs for Alzheimer's, none of those drugs work. They're advertised heavily, they cause, have all sorts of side effects. So when you get data from a uh, pharma, again, I, you know, I, I love the drugs that pharma's created, but when it comes to making a decision, an objective decision, you need objective data and it won't come from pharma, it's an ad. 
When a drug rep comes, and hopefully you don't see them, they, they were banned from this campus uh, for, I'm, they're still kind of lurking around, but they're more or less banned. <laughs> yes, there are still pharma sponsored lunches uh, in some of the departments here, which I find to be uh, depressing. They're not giving you informed uh, information. It's a sales pitch. It's like trying to sell you a car. They're just basically coming, give you what, what information they get. They're not going to say to you, you know what, our drug is great, but Gentech has a much better drug, so you should use that. They're, not, they're never going to say that. And the conclusion, this has been shown, again, I don't want to you know, overstate it, but there have been 30 years of research here, on, uh, not here, over in the world, on conclusions of drug companies. And a, a drug company uh, funded study is far more likely to have positive conclusions and downplay the risks. So, you know, you take it, you, don't, you, you just read it and you get some idea, but when it comes to those people coming and giving you pharma-related uh, information, you just ignore it. So here's the story of Crestor. I've already mentioned Crestor. It's a drug to lower cholesterol. There are other drugs. Uh, these are reports from the Times. Uh, it became known that uh, 31 patients died from taking Crestor. Meanwhile, there were all these other statins that didn't cause death. New drug, Chase policy, never use a new drug unless it's the only drug, and even then, think twice. So 31 people died from taking this drug. Why prescribe the newest drug on the block when these other drugs work just as well? It's all about advertising and about pharma going to the office, giving free samples, and brainwashing the doctors. But what's really disturbing is that the higher-ups at Bayer knew about these deaths and did not pull the drug off the market until you know, several months later. That there's, it's sort of the, the cheaters uh, often don't tell anybody what's going on, uh, and then eventually it gets discovered. So all these people died, and they didn't pull the drug from the market. Uh, so this is just another reason I don't want to sound overly paranoid, but basically ignore anything you hear from pharma. Look at basic articles in New England Journal of Medicine uh, and think twice about new drugs. I want to uh, finish with how do we describe adverse events? How do we find new adverse events? And that relies on us. That relies on us to go plumb the data or you know, really do some data mining and figure out what is a potential side effect that has never been described before. It's called pharmacovigilance. You're vigilant about pharmacology. It's a new field in data mining where people all over the country that are involved in this. Uh, and uh, the basic premise is that all the targets of the drug are not fully known when it's released. I've already mentioned that. Most, most drug-drug interactions cannot be predicted. And it can take decades for fully know all the side effects. And lastly, um, just because a side effect of a drug has not been published doesn't mean it doesn't exist. Uh, there's a great study where patients complained to their doctors about, I took that drug and that happened. And the doctor said, well, I, you know, I went through the literature and it doesn't exist, so meaning that's not a side effect. I took, when I started on Lipitor, I thought, I'll take it before I go to bed. I'll put it right next to my toothbrush and I won't forget. And I developed insomnia. I mean, I've never had insomnia in my life. You know, I see the pillow and I'm asleep. And I, so I go through the literature, PubMed, I do, you know, extensive search, not a single report of Lipitor and insomnia. Then you hit the blogosphere, and the blogosphere has all these threads with don't take Lipitor before you go to bed because you'll get insomnia, and like I'm saying nasty things to the other bloggers. <laughs> don't tell you, like, you idiot, why didn't you take it before you go to bed? And so actually when I was uh, advised to IBM on Watson several years ago, I would try to get them, why don't you mine the blogosphere? Because that's where a lot of the real, real information about adverse events is. And actually, I reviewed a paper a couple of weeks ago that did just that. They mined the blogosphere to look for um, adverse events to a drug and had some success with their method. So how do we do that? Uh, the FDA, God bless them, has a site called AIRS Adverse Events Reporting System. And you're taking care of a patient, and you give them Lipitor, and they say they're insomniac. You report that. It doesn't mean that you know that it's a side effect. Although, I'm, I'm pay, you know, people are pretty good at cause and effect. Like the average person, I did that and then that happened. Um, so I'd like to take what they report seriously. So um, fair or heirs, they want you to report to them 
what you think might be an adverse event. Then the data is made available to all of us. And my colleagues and I you know, studied this over the years. We published several papers on new adverse events using this method. Um, and uh, you can do some data mining. So there's some challenges, though, and I will say the following. I mean, let's just say you're looking at the adverse event diabetes. What drugs cause diabetes? And you say, well, what are the what's it associated with? People with diabetes, it's association, not causal, as you all know the difference. So what drugs is, is diabetes associated? I've got gigantic uh, database patients with diabetes, without diabetes, and all the drugs they've ever taken, we have all that in our database. And you go, wow, there are two drugs that are associated with diabetes, statins and insulin. Now, we know fully well that the reasons why insulin and diabetes are associated is that insulin treats diabetes. But then we say, well, hold on a second, statins don't treat diabetes. So maybe that's a possible adverse event. But then it becomes a little more complicated because diabetes is known to cause chronic kidney disease. People with chronic kidney disease with diabetes get chronic kidney disease. You'll learn all about that next year. And we see that in some spheres, guidelines, they use statins to treat chronic kidney disease, uh, and, but they also find that it's associated with diabetes. And so we've got more complicated associations. It's called confounding. Does the statins? You know, do they really associate with diabetes or is it just because we treat kidney disease with them? So there are sophisticated data mining algorithms uh, that are out there that people all over the country are using. And as a result, new adverse events never been described beforehand are being uh, identified. So let me um, end with a um, shameless plug for the department, for my department, and say, ask you, are you looking for a truly cool way to spend your summer? and get paid. Join the department, and as you probably have heard from the dean, we have summer fellowships for first year students. Uh, it's a great stipend. Virtually everybody with a good project gets funded. Uh, it's a great way to spend the summer. And how irresistible are we? There we are. And so I just invite you to our annual uh, meet and greet with the department. It's you know wine and cheese on December 6th. I'll send you a reminder a couple of days before. I think the med students are going to have a town hall meeting with Dean Drusen at 5. Uh, send your reminder, but please, I welcome you all. Thank you.